Welcome to The Planning Podcast. I'm Richard Kimblin, and I'm joined today by James Corbett Bircher, known more familiarly to most of you as JCB. He's been looking at a scheme from South Oxfordshire, which ended up before the Secretary of State, who turned it away. He explains why that is so in the context of there being an absence of a five-year supply, but an up-to-date neighbourhood plan. What happened? He will now explain. So, James, hello and good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Richard. Splendid. Thank you very much for joining and thank you very much for engaging with what is an interesting Secretary of State's decision from a site in Cholsey in South Oxfordshire. Here we have the benefit of both a substantial inspector's report and a concurring Secretary of State's decision. What, what's it all about? Well, Richard, this is the, one of the ongoing battles in the long-running neighbourhood plan wars. It is a decision which effectively confirms how neighbourhood planning policy under MPPF 14 works when you are well inside the two-year period for the purpose of 14A through to D. In effect, it's a big scheme that was not in the neighbourhood plan, was found to be contrary to the strategy in the local plan and the neighbourhood plan, and as a consequence, although the housing land supply was somewhere in the region of the threes in all likelihood. Effectively, the presumption did not apply to ensure that there was a grant of permission overall. That's the core issue from this case. So we've got an, an August inquiry stretching out into September in respect of what's described as a mixed-use development, 350 dwellings, a bit of C2, some retail, a bit of employment, genuinely mixed. In a district, as you've identified, no five-year land supply, but with with a neighbourhood plan. What was the state of the neighbourhood plan here and um, why was it important? So cr- critically for the two-year period purposes, the plan had been remade in October of 2022. So although a lot of the work had been done on the appeal prior to that date, effectively there, there'd been this review, it was then made at that point and critically although there have been efforts to explore allocating this site it was made clear by the parish council promoting the plan that this was not an allocated site and effectively therefore other sites have been allocated in the area and our overall this site was in conflict with the neighborhood plan what did the inspector make of that overall situation where we've got a a neighbourhood plan pretty up to date, lack of five-year land supply, but we've got this critical part of the framework which addresses neighbourhood plans and provides for a special approach in that regard. Just help listeners with what what the situation was and what the inspector found. Yeah, so effectively the inspector works systematically through all the stages of 14A through to D. And this reasoning is then effectively transported into the Secretary of State's decision as well. In essence, what the inspector found was that having established it's in conflict with the neighbourhood plan, the neighbourhood plan had obviously, as a matter of fact, been made, I statutorily adopted, within the two years. And critically, this neighbourhood plan had policies and allocations to meet its identified housing requirement. And there are a number of comments throughout the decision about the extent that both the local plan level and also this neighbourhood plan level in Chelsea, a larger village, in effect, the, the plan, notwithstanding the housing land supply figures, had allocated more than was needed to meet its housing requirements. Specifically in Chelsea, I think the provisions were some of the reason of effectively 15% growth type figures, and that had been front loaded in the neighbourhood plan area. And effectively, they were saying what the inspector better concluded and the secretary said agreed with is that the neighbourhood plan had done enough. And this is effectively how that specific provision about having policies and allocations to meet an identified housing requirement works. In effect, if there's obvious evidence that the neighbourhood plan has made provision for allocations, then it would have done what it's required to by national policy, effectively to disapply the presumption. Now, 
in this case, the, the inspector expresses himself in ways which are clear and really quite emphatic. So when we get to page 113 of the document, we, we find the, the inspector expressing himself about whether or not this is or is not in the right place and whether or not this development plan position yields any possibility of recommending the grant of consent and keeping the public on side in respect of respect for plan-led development. Do you, want, do you want to say something about the way in which the inspector reasoned the conclusions? So as we get to the planning balance, we see all the different considerations laid out in fairly conventional ways. But then as we get to the final paragraphs, we get to perhaps what the inspector was really thinking about the overall decision. And at 392... There's four paragraphs from the end. The inspector says, well, the matter can proceed to have weighty considerations on both sides, so both benefits and harms. And he notes in particular affordable housing and extra care of the person's housing. And then says, but it's in the wrong place. And those wordings there, we've often maybe thought inspectors might be thinking that as we sit there, but it's uh, read to him, express it, you know, with quite that clarity. I think there's a couple of words missing there, but there's simply the fact that it's in the wrong place. But nonetheless, it's very clear what the inspector's saying is he didn't meet with the special strategy. What the inspector then adds to that, it would be very helpful, I think, just in terms of thinking about how we deal with neighbourhood plans and relatively recently adopted local plans. The inspector then says at 394, the very final substantive paragraph, there is an elephant in the room which has not been hitherto discussed, and that is the effect on public faith in the plan-led system were this appeal to be allowed. And critically, what the inspector refers to is not just the neighbourhood plan and the considerable portion of the local population, in his words, who've been involved in it, but also South Oxfordshire. He says South Oxfordshire has an up-to-date local plan in which considerable public involvement has been invested. So what we're seeing there is an inspector endorsement of the local plan system in these specific circumstances where you've got a large development, 350 plus, 400 plus units effectively being placed contrary to what the spatial strategy had envisaged overall. So there we have a great degree of respect being expressed for that particular local, from the Localism Act, from, from the local part of the development plan. No bulldozing of local opinion there, uh, quite the opposite, and expressed in in a way which really does attract attention. Um, It's an elephant in the room. And if that plan, having engaged people in the way that it has, has yielded the conclusion that development in this location would be development in the wrong place, and a place which is not a a well-endowed location, to quote the inspector, then that's going to be respected and the outcome follows accordingly. Absolutely. And I should say at this point that the way in which the Secretary of State then takes those findings when it comes to the final decision, effectively the Secretary of State doesn't need to add a lot more in terms of the analysis of that. There are some references, a little bit of extra wording here and there, but effectively the Secretary of State just simply endorsing that. And I think therefore it's a, it's a demonstration case in which and there often are in neighbourhood plan cases such as this recommendations to grant which are overturned but this is a case where the, where the inspector reached a firm view and the Secretary of State therefore didn't need to add anything else by way of taking into account any broader considerations about neighbourhood planning to simply reach an overall decision about what should happen in this specific case. Well James that's fantastic it's a short run through a very long decision capturing what the key issues really are. People will be very interested to have heard your analysis of that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Richard. That was the planning podcast. Next, we're going to go back to court. There's so much really important material coming out of the planning court at the moment. We're going to review some of that for you in our next episode. But until then, thank you and goodbye.